Why do you seem so scared? All I wanted to do was play with you. Please come and play with me. I am so lonely. You're not afraid of the dark, are you? Don't be afraid. Come with me. I will show you where I play hide and seek. Do you want to play hide and seek? You hide, and I'll find you. In February 1993, two-year-old James Bulger from Liverpool, England, was abducted, tortured, and murdered. Britons were outraged and appalled by the crime itself, but what was even more shocking was the identities of the perpetrators. This is an example of how, in rare cases, children are capable of committing some of the most atrocious crimes one would normally expect from adult offenders. The guilty parties are John Venables and Robert Thompson, both 10 years old at the time, with their birthdays being two weeks apart. This is the story of how they committed the crime that marked them for life. February 12, 1993. John Venables was late for school. It didn't make much of a difference since he planned on being truant that day. He went to some bushes to hide his school bag. He met Robert Thompson at the top of the village, by a church. Robert was with his younger brother, Ryan. Sag, or sagging, was a slang term that meant skipping school. John asked Robert if he was sagging, and Robert confirmed he was. Ryan decided to go to school despite John's offer of two quid, which is approximately two dollars in North American currency. Ryan went to school. John and Robert disappeared down the entryways, careful to avoid being spotted while passing the school. They were spotted by a student named Nicola, and a teacher named Miss Rigg noted their truancy in her attendance record. Miss Rigg had noticed some peculiarities in John's behavior. She moved his desk to the back of the class the day before. He was awkward, fidgety, and excitable. Whatever it was that made him so restless, he could hardly contain it. After an assembly, the head teacher, Irene Slack, spoke to Nicola, who confirmed for her that Robert and John were walking in the opposite direction to the school. Miss Slack called the Education Welfare Office. She also called John's mother. There was no answer. As John and Robert walked to the town of Boodle, they talked about shoplifting and sagging. They were still wearing articles of their school uniforms. In the Strand shopping mall, a clerk in Clinton cards saw the boys in their uniforms and called to them from behind the till. Robert and John were looking over a display of troll dolls. Robert was fond of trolls and would have stolen one or two if it had been possible. The clerk said to him, you off school then? Robert said, yeah, it's Baker's day. Do you mean inset day? No, half term. The clerk continued to grill them, asking what school they went to and where it was located. John gave Robert's foot a light stamp to indicate it was time to go. Before leaving, Robert said to the clerk, we're with our mum, and they were off. From there, they went to Superdrug. Robert stole a toy soldier. It was mechanized, and he tried to make it crawl along the rubber railing of an escalator. Whether he dropped it or threw it, the toy fell to the floor below, and a woman told them off. Robert and John ignored her. That woman saw Robert and John again as she waited on a bench outside of Boots. This time they were walking out of a department store called T.J. Hughes with a small child in tow. All three boys were laughing. Robert and John would run forward, stop, and turn as the younger boy ran at them, laughing. Suddenly, the youngest boy's mother appeared. She was in a panic. She called her son back and scolded him for wandering off. John and Robert walked away. 
They return to T.J. Hughes in search for items to steal. A woman named Mrs. Power was shopping with her three-year-old daughter and her two-year-old son. She was browsing for sweatshirts. Nearby, her children were looking at a display of purses. Robert and John were also there, kneeling, opening, and closing the purses, giving the appearance of playing some sort of game with her children. Having selected a sweatshirt, she went to retrieve her children. She overheard John say to Robert, Tomo, take one of these. They froze when Mrs. Power approached. She took her children to the cashiers. There was a lineup at the checkout counters. Mrs. Power's children wandered off again. She retrieved them once more, and still they wandered off. Her daughter came back to her. Mrs. Power said to her, Where's your brother? Gone outside with the boys. After checking the purse counter, Mrs. Power went to the store's entrance, where she saw her son walking toward Robert and John. John stood by a mirrored pole, calling her son to him. Mrs. Power shouted at him, and he stopped. John said to her son, Go back to your mom. The boy returned to his mother. Mrs. Power scolded him. John and Robert walked over to mother care. The Bulger family kept late hours. They went to bed late at night and woke up late in the morning. The night before this day, their two-year-old son James fell asleep just before midnight. Denise was highly protective and preferred to keep James by her side. She and her husband Ralph had been married for three years. Their first pregnancy resulted in a daughter who was stillborn. This loss resulted in Denise becoming attached to James to an extent that some might consider excessive. She didn't want him to go out with her friends or even her relatives. She was so overprotective she couldn't bear to send him to play school. He went to bed when she did and was roused from sleep after she got up. This morning, the Bulgers were awakened out of bed by 10.30. After having breakfast, Denise took James to her mother's home. Ralph went from there to the home of Denise's brother, Paul. Her brother John lived in town as well, and Paul's girlfriend, Nicola Bailey, was looking after his three-year-old daughter, Vanessa. She called to ask Denise if she wanted to go to the Strand. Denise agreed, and they went to the Strand in the afternoon. At the Strand, Denise and Nicola went to Woolworths. After leaving this store, Denise gave James and Nicola's daughter, Vanessa, a ride on a children's mechanical seesaw. From there, they went to T.J. Hughes. While Nicola made an exchange, Denise observed the two children playing in the store. At one point, James lost sight of his mother, and the separation anxiety was too much for him. He cried out for Denise. She swiftly rushed over to him and carried him as they left the store. John and Robert walked in and out of the stores of the Strand, stealing what they could. They threw most of it away making room in their pockets for something more desirable. Robert had his sights on a boxed troll in T.J. Hughes. A security guard told them to leave. John managed to steal a couple of felt-tipped pens, though he left them on a cooker that was put on display. They had a look at computer games and peripheral equipment in other stores. They stole a four-pack of AA batteries from a store called Tandy, they looked at the toys on display in Woolworths. There was nothing on the shelves they considered worth stealing. Across the road from the Strand, they went to McDonald's for a time. From there, they went to Bradford and Bingley Building Society next door. The branch manager asked them what they were up to. Robert told them they were waiting for their mother. After he observed them clamoring over the chairs, the branch manager suggested they wait in McDonald's. Robert informed them they had already been thrown out of McDonald's, but John said, come on, let's go. They went to Quickie to steal some ice cream treats. After leaving, they ran into the branch manager on the street. Robert asked him for 20 pence. The branch manager said no and walked on. They re-entered the Strand. They walked in through Lun Poli and posed as shoppers. John tried to steal a pen off the counter, but was caught when he knocked over a stapler. 
Another pen went missing from the Rathbones Bakery, across the way from Clinton Cards. The boys went back in the card shop. The clerk watched them closely this time. The boys loitered by the troll display. A middle-aged woman came in. She said, Come on, where's the pen you took off the lady in Rathbones? Robert tapped his pockets and said, What pen? I haven't got a pen. The woman threatened to call the police, so Robert pulled the pen from his pocket and handed it to her. The woman told the clerk to watch the boys. The clerk told John and Robert to leave. John and Robert walked to the main square of the mall. They played with the fire hydrant door on the pillar. They opened and closed it, shouting and laughing as they did so. A four-year-old boy approached them and asked them what they were doing. His older brother called them away. John was parched. They went into Tesco, where John emptied his coat and refilled it with yogurt, a milkshake, and ambrosia rice. Robert also scored some refreshments. They sat and ate on some scaffolding outside. A stall was set up in the middle of the main square. It was a display set up as part of a mental health campaign. The purpose was to promote awareness of the effects of tranquilizers and sleeping pills. There were books, leaflets, and audio cassettes on display. John and Robert paid a visit to the display. Robert picked up a book called Back to Life, which was about techniques to withdraw from addiction to tranquilizers. The stall was run by a mother and daughter. The mother told Robert to put the book down, insisting it would be of no interest to him. The boys mimed grabbing motions at the items. The mother told them to go away and stop being cheeky. She told them they should be in school. They teased her, tapping on her back and running away when she turned around. They did this repeatedly. At one point, she struck outward, swinging her arm and shouting at them. They ran off, cursing at her. The boys went to Toy Master because Robert wanted to show John a talking troll doll. They were turned away by a clerk, who told them they could only enter with their parents. They waited until a clerk was busy with the customers and ran in again. They came out with cans of enamel paint, the colors being azure blue and antique bronze. They used the can of blue paint like a soccer ball, kicking it back and forth to each other. At some point, the can cracked against a pane of glass and cracked open. It began to leak paint. Denise carried James as she walked from TJ Hughes with Nicola and Vanessa. They went to Sayers, where they bought sausage rolls for the children. From there, they went to do some shopping in Marks and Spencer and other stores. Denise made a stop at A.R. Tim's, a butcher shop. Denise and Nicola went in. Denise put James down and took out money to pay for her order. Nicola was holding Vanessa. She turned around and saw James at the entrance. He was restless, bored, and getting into mischief. He had gotten a hold of a lit cigarette butt. She turned around and went to the counter to place an order. Denise paid for hers and walked toward the entrance. Denise, rus Denise rushed back in the store. She was panicking. She said to Nicola, Where's James? Nicola said, He's only just outside. John and Robert were done playing with the paint cans. They were outside of T.J. Hughes next to the sweet barrow, much to their disappointment as they were hoping to steal some candy. It was locked up. They turned and faced A.R. Timms. A little boy in a blue anorak was standing outside. He was eating Smarties. John came up with the idea of approaching him. He walked up to James Bulger and said, Come on, baby. James followed him and John took his hand. They walked back in the direction of T.J. Hughes. They walked into T.J. Hughes, through the store, and up a flight of stairs. They exited and turned left into the walkway by Sayers that led to the main square. A woman saw James and mistook him for her grandson. When she realized it was not her grandson, she wondered why he was alone before he was joined by the two older boys. The little one skipped to join them when one of them said, Come on, baby. 
Robert led John and James as they walked toward the entrance to the Strand. Security camera footage of this event can be viewed on YouTube. Denise went outside the butcher shop while Nicola was served. She came back in. She said to Nicola, I can't find him outside. She rushed back to the door. One of the shop assistants realized something was amiss. They said to her, what's wrong? The little boy's gone missing from outside. The shop assistant suggested she go to security and submit a report. Denise and Nicola dashed out, heading for security. They stopped into a few stores along the way, asking staff if they had seen a little boy. Denise was deeply upset by the time she reached security. They had never dealt with a missing child report before. Usually when a child wandered off, they were found 15 to 20 minutes later. The guard took a description of James and details, like where he was last seen, what he was wearing. He disseminated this information to the precinct. Denise and Nicola went on their own search. They returned to the security department five minutes later and asked the guard to repeat the report. The guard looked at the security cameras, but saw no boy walking by himself. He reissued the report. Denise and Nicola took off again. The guard received a call from T.J. Hughes. Denise was there. She wanted to know if James had been found yet. He had not. The guard passed along a description of James Bulger for the store's internal tannoy system. Denise returned to the security station at quarter after four with a security officer from T.J. Hughes. Still no sign of James. The Strand's guard called Marsh Lane Police Station, which was located nearby. He reported the disappearance of James Bulger. James was carried the first few yards along Stanley Road. It was awkward, since James was not an infant. He was held with a bear hug. A taxi driver saw this and laughed at the older boy's inexperience with children. James was put down on the pavement between the post office and the bridge over a canal. He began to cry. One of the boys said to him, Are you all right? You were told not to run. He said it loud enough to be heard clearly by passers-by. James said, I want my mum. They made a turn off Stanley Road, past railings, and down a slope towards the canal towpath. John Venables was holding James' hand. Robert Thompson walked beside them. A woman came out of a post office and saw the three boys. They seemed to be in a hurry. The youngest would wander ahead, but be ushered back. She thought he looked confused. It also occurred to her that the other boys looked too young to be entrusted with the care of a toddler. She assumed they were brothers or other relatives. Once at the canal, John and Robert went under the bridge and sat James on the guardrail that separated the towpath from the water. They discussed pushing him into the canal. One of them picked James up and turned him upside down. He dropped him to the ground head first. James's head was grazed and he started crying. John and Robert ran back up the slope, leaving James alone back at the guardrail, where he continued to cry. A woman who was walking over the bridge heard his cries and looked down. When she saw James, she assumed he was with other children she saw by the towpath. There were always children at play down there. John and Robert returned to James. James walked up the path toward them. One of them said, Come on, baby. They pulled up the hood of his anorak to hide the cut on his forehead. One of them carried James across Stanley Road at the pedestrian crossing and put him down once across. A woman noticed the trio and despite the boy's best efforts to conceal it, she saw the gash on James's forehead. The toddler appeared to be distressed, though he was no longer crying. She walked away, feeling slightly uneasy about it. She turned around to have another look. The boys had disappeared. John, Robert, and James turned off the main road, down Park Street, past the Jehovah's Witnesses Hall. They turned right at the bottom and left at the Jawbone Tavern. They walked through a car park adjacent to a block of apartments. 
John and Robert lifted James over a wall. They emerged on Merton Road through the grounds of an architect's office. They were now on the route they took earlier to the Strand, heading back to Walton. A motorist recalled seeing the three boys, who were pulling at James's arms, forcing him along. James's face was flushed, and he was crying. Robert gave James a kick in the ribs to further goad him along. They led James from Oxford Road to Breeze Hill. They idled at the railings by a bus stop. John ran down the hill, chasing James toward Robert. The hood of James's coat still covered his head. James started crying again as they crossed Breeze Hill by the Mons at the junction with Southport Road. James still said, still crying, I want my mum, I want my mum, I want my mum. James ran forward onto a road. Robert picked him up and turned him away from the road. John and Robert both held James by the hand as they crossed the central reservation. They left the road at the reservoir. They climbed up big stone steps. They were both carrying James now. John held his legs. Robert had his arms around James's chest. Once they reached the top of the reservoir, John and Robert sat on the last step with James between them. A woman walking her dog later noted that James was laughing. As she descended, the boys stood and made their way to the far embankment, which overlooked a row of houses. The daylight began to fade. John punched James. A woman closing her curtains nearby saw John gripping James by his shoulders, close to his neck, and shaking him aggressively, as if to hush him up. Another neighbor saw John and Robert holding James's hands. They were helping him up the incline. The woman walking her dog approached the boys. She was concerned about James, since he was sobbing. She said to the boys, What's going on? One of them said, We just found him at the bottom of the hill. The woman saw that there were two bumps on James's head, one on his forehead and the other on the top of his head. She said, Do you know him? The boy said no. She told them that James's injuries were in want of medical attention. They asked her where the police station was. She told them it was at Walton Lane. The neighbor at her window was surprised when she saw the boys head in the opposite direction from the one the woman with the dog appeared to have given them. The woman with the dog turned around and shouted after them, but this did nothing to deter them from their course. The police were contacted and an officer was dispatched to the Strand. Denise was beside herself with distress. She couldn't believe it had happened so quickly. To quote Denise, I was only in the shop for a few seconds. I turned round and he'd gone. She was plagued by remorse and self-blame. She beat up on herself, wondering if the outcome had been different if she had done this or that. The police officer who attended to the case promised Denise that everything was being done to find James. James's disappearance was announced on local radio stations. Some leads were called into the police, but proved to be unreliable. Information about James's disappearance was distributed to other media, to taxi firms, and other transportation services. Police began searching on foot and by car through the Strand and outside. They searched along and around the canal and throughout the streets, walkways, car parks, retail businesses, amusement arcades, no stone was left unturned. An announcement was made on a public address system at the Strand. At one point, a police helicopter searched from above. The police tried to find Ralph Bulger without success. He did not yet know his son had gone missing. John and Robert came down from the reservoir and turned back onto Breeze Hill. They began to walk toward the flyover, towards Walton. A woman in a house nearby heard a noise on the street outside. It sounded like a child moaning. She looked out and saw the three boys on the pavement in front of her house. John and Robert were walking with James between them. They each held one of his hands. Later they were seen as they passed news agents on the corner of Emory Street. 
a woman heard one of the boys say to James, Come on. She thought James looked a little bewildered. She went into a store. When she came back out, they had disappeared. John and Robert continued along with James in tow. Another woman with a dog asked about the situation. They told her they found James at the Strand. She asked them why they didn't take him to a police station. They told her they were going to Walton Lane Police Station. A younger woman overheard the conversation and observed the three boys. James looked tired and moderately distressed. He looked up at Robert. The younger woman said, What's the matter? Is there a problem? The woman with the dog said, They've just asked me the way to Walton Lane Police Station. The younger woman said to the boys, Why do you want a police station? John said, We found him by the strand. The younger woman said, If you found him by the strand, why didn't you go to the police station by the strand? The woman with the dog said, That's what I asked. John said, I don't know where it is. The woman with the dog said, Well, you've walked a long way from the strand to Walton Lane Police Station. A man told us to come this way. The younger woman thought this was strange. She turned to Robert. Why go to Walton Lane Police Station? John said, That's where the man directed us. Where do you live? Robert was about to answer, but John intervened. The police station's on our way home. Robert let go of James's hand and looked away. The younger woman thought he looked uneasy and nervous. John said to Robert, get hold of his hand. The younger woman said to them, Walton Lane's in that direction, and pointed to where it was. James looked up and over to the woman and then to John. The woman said to James, are you all right, son? James said nothing. John said to her, which is the way? He looked over the road to St. Mary's Church. Did you say it was over this way? She said the best way is to go across behind Walton Church. The boys turned and went back down the walkways under the flyover. The younger woman called to them to stop because she didn't think it was safe for them down there in the dark. John said to her, Which way again, missus? She said, The village, and pointed to the church. The boys crossed to the central reservation. The young woman shouted, Are you sure you know the way? John turned around and pointed down County Road. He said, I'll go that way, missus. Robert said to John, Our Ken will know, though he did not have a brother named Ken. Later, the boys were walking on Walton Lane with a railway bridge to their left. One of the boys kept pushing James onto the road. James was laughing. When passers-by saw this, one of the boys retrieved James from the road and picked him up, pulling him to the sidewalk. James was still laughing. The search for James Bulger involved more and more territory and more and more personnel. Denise and Ralph Bulger awaited the final news anxiously. Sunday morning, a driver of an early morning train watched as the train moved along, slowly and steadily, at 20 miles per hour. Along the way, he saw something lying on the ground near the other track. He leaned forward to get a better look at it. It looked like a dummy or a doll. Kids were often putting things like that across the tracks. On his way back home after his shift, he remembered the object he saw. Something was not quite right about it. Later in the evening, he remembered having seen news coverage of a boy who had gone missing. When he realized exactly what he had seen, he called transport police. Some local children were playing at the railroad tracks. One child, known as Beckett, said, Eh, hey, look at that, a dead cat or something. The rest of the children had a look. Whatever it was, it was bundled up in a coat. Beckett touched it lightly with his foot. There was no response. He looked back across the track and shouted, Look, there's its legs. A boy named Pitts remarked that they looked like a doll's legs. Beckett became frightened and wanted to run away. Pitts went in closer to the legs. He said they did not belong to a doll. There was a pair of boys' underpants nearby. One of the children said it was like a baby. One of them, known as Stee, said, 
I think it is a baby. He ran, shouting, and in a panic, up the line toward the police station. All the kids were mortified now. The other kids joined Stee, running to the police. Once there, they rang the bell. They were hysterical, shouting and screaming. P.C. Osborne came from the office, from a one-way glass, to ask what was wrong. The boys looked very agitated. They told him there was a baby on the railway line cut in half. The officer told them to stay put, and he retrieved his radio. He notified other officers about what the children found. They told the children not to follow, but they did anyway. They saw Osborne recoil when he saw the body. The body of James Bulger. He asked British Rail to close the line. A police officer by the name of Jeff McDonald delivered the bad news to Denise Bulger. Yes, I'm sorry, we found James. Denise screamed. Ralph was still out searching and could not be contacted. When Ralph arrived, McDonald informed him of his findings. Ralph dealt with his grief with anger. He punched and kicked a screen that stood nearby. After Denise was taken home, Ralph paced up and down. He asked endless questions, demanding the details of how James ended up dead. The homicide investigation had just begun, so the details had yet to trickle in. James's body had been lying at a right angle across a track, with the upper half inside the track. It appeared to have been covered in bricks. It was severed in half when a train came along. The train dragged the lower half 15 feet. The lower half of the body had been stripped of all clothing. The clothing that was removed was scattered around the upper half of the body. There was a pair of tracksuit bottoms lightly stained with blood and paint. A pair of white sneakers were found, one with the shoelace undone and the other with the shoelace still tied. A pair of white socks with blue stripes lay nearby and were lightly stained with blood. His underwear were soaked with blood and found under a brick. There was a heavy strip of steel lying against the bricks. It is commonly known as a fish plate. A fish plate is used to connect one length of railroad track to another. It was two feet long and weighed 22 pounds. It too was stained with blood. A white scarf stained with blood was lying on the side between the track and the embankment. Three AA batteries were scattered near the scarf. Two of them were stained with blood. The sleepers and ballast of the scarf were blood stained. Blood was spattered on the neighboring wall of the old station platform. A trail of blood led across the tracks to the upper half of the body. Two bricks stained with blood sat near the scarf. Others were placed around the body. There was an S-shaped pandrel securing clip that was stained with blood. Some blonde hairs were stuck to it. The clip was typically used with a fish plate when constructing the rail line. A can of Humbrol brand Azure Blue paint was found on the track on the other side of a bridge. There were splotches of blue paint around the can. A box of quality street candies and other sweets were found nearby. The pathologist arrived at 5 p.m. Now the clothing could be disturbed. He determined that the body sustained multiple injuries to the head. The wounds bled profusely. The left side of James's face, as well as his ear, neck, and parka, were stained with blue paint. The body was taken to a mortuary for identification and an autopsy. Once there, Ray Bulger, Ralph's brother, positively identified the body as belonging to James Bulger at 9 p.m. The autopsy began at 10.45 and was finished at 1.30 a.m. Here are details about the murder of James Bulger that emerged during the post-mortem examination. He died from severe head injuries. His skull was fractured multiple times. The blows were delivered with one or more heavy blunt objects. He died sometime after these injuries, but before the train severed his body. 
There were wounds all over his face and head. There were 20 separate bruises, scratches, abrasions, and lacerations. A patterned bruise on his right cheek suggested that it was caused by a shoe. The lower lip was partially pulled away, which may have been caused either by a blow or a kick. There were bruises and cuts to the rest of his body, including the shoulders, chest, arms, and legs. Though it could not have been proven definitively that sexual assault occurred, there had been some hemorrhaging in the pelvis near the rectum. His foreskin was reported as appearing abnormal due to having apparently been forcefully retracted. There were linear abrasions across his buttocks. The pathologist speculated that they were caused by dragging of the body. Brick dust and fragments were found on his body and in his clothing. The investigation to find the perpetrators of this grisly crime began in earnest. Having seen the abduction on the video taken in the Strand, they knew the suspects were minors. The images were not clear enough to indicate how old they were. The police held press conferences. They also had a look at truancy records that were kept at local schools. They submitted the security footage to television stations so that they could air it on the news. The police decided that all suspects would have to submit to DNA profiling. People called in with tips about wayward youths that were known to them, but none of these leads checked out. Wednesday evening, Officer Jim Fitzsimmons received a written message from another officer. A woman called in to say that her mother's friend had a son by the name of John Venables. He had been skipping school on Friday with a boy named Robert Thompson. John came home late. He had paint on his jacket. The woman saw the security video and saw a resemblance in one of the boys to John. Though she declined to be involved in the case, an officer was dispatched to take a statement from her. Jim asked for local intelligence records to be examined to see if there was a paper trail for the names of the two boys. He took a look at the roster of detectives that were available to handle arrests in the morning. Robert Thompson didn't have a criminal record, but his older brother had been charged with some petty crimes. His mugshot indicated a resemblance to the boy seen in the security video. The woman who reported John Venable said he attended Bedford Road School. The headmistress was contacted. She confirmed the boys were students there and were both 10 years old. Venables had two homes, one with his mother and the other with his father. Fitzsimmons ordered search warrants. Two separate teams were assigned, one for the arrest of Robert Thompson and the other for John Venables. The boys would be detained and interviewed separately at the police station closest to their homes. Thursday morning, 7.30 a.m., Ann Thompson was woken up by Robert. He said, Mom, there's four men on the doorstep. You'd better get up. The four men were Detective Phil Roberts and three other detectives. Two more stood in back of the house. Phil Roberts showed her the search warrant and explained why they were there. Anne was flustered and anxious, but she invited them in. Robert was called into the front room. He sat down. Phil Roberts got down on his knees in front of Robert and informed him he was being arrested on suspicion of having been involved in the murder of James Bulger. Robert began to cry, saying, I didn't kill him. His mother began to cry too. As the officers searched the house, they were particularly intent on finding his shoes and the clothing he wore on the day of James Bulger's disappearance. One pair of shoes were forgotten when the officers went to the station. When they were retrieved hours later, they found that the shoes were spattered with blood. At the home of Susan Venables, she said to Detective Mark Dale, I knew you'd be here. I told him you'd want to see him for sagging school on Friday. Dale said, see whom? Susan said, our John. John came down the stairs just then, and they all went into the living room. Susan turned to John. There you are, sagging. I told you they'd be here. She turned back to Mark Dale. He came home on Friday, 
coat full of paint. Turning back to John, she said, paint, sagging. I told you they'd be here. Dale asked Susan to show him the coat. John took his parka and threw it down at the officer's feet. Detective George Scott picked it up. They observed blue paint on the sleeve. Susan said it was John's. They went back to the living room. Dale told John he was being arrested on suspicion of the abduction and murder of James Bulger. John grabbed onto his mother. He was crying and shouting, I don't want to go to prison, Mom. I didn't kill the baby. She said, don't be silly, John. You won't go to prison. They're just doing their job. John was still crying. The other officers attempted to calm him by talking about school. He said to them, it's that Robert Thompson. He always gets me into trouble. When Mark Dale and George Scott returned, he asked them, are you going to speak to Robert Thompson? Why, do you think we should? Yes. John ran upstairs to get washed and dressed. He was still very upset. As John was taking the Lower Lane Police Station, he asked, Is someone with Robert Thompson now? Which police station will he be going to? Once at the station, John was placed in the juvenile detention room. Charges could not yet be laid because the boys had not been interviewed. Other security footage from the Strand revealed that the boys had touched some surfaces. Police dusted the surfaces for fingerprints. Late Thursday morning, the arresting officers fingerprinted Robert and John. While John was getting his done, he said, Do you leave these on whatever you touch? Will Robert Thompson be getting his too? Will Robert Thompson be getting his done too? The prints were sent to the Bureau at headquarters and compared with the prints taken from the Bradford and Bingley Building Society. They didn't find a match for Robert Thompson, but John's left thumb and left middle finger were positively identified. When a police surgeon arrived at Walton Lane Station, Robert submitted samples of his blood, fingernails, and hair. Robert was determined to be fit to be interviewed. His mother sat outside, weeping quietly. Robert was returned to the detention room. After a while, he began to cry and bang on the door. The custody sergeant went to see him. Robert said to him, Why am I here? I want to go home. Come on, lad, you know why you're here. I didn't kill him. I saw him once with his mum. The custody sergeant told Robert he was under caution and he advised him not to say anything more. He did what he could to calm him and he locked the door. John submitted his own samples. At one point he asked, If you touch someone's skin, does it leave a fingerprint? If you drag someone really hard, do you leave your nails in his skin? Robert Thompson was interviewed by Detective Sergeant Phil Roberts. The following is from the transcript of that interview. Roberts. I'm also arresting you, right, for abducting James, okay? Robert. What does abducting mean? Roberts. On suspicion of abducting, meaning taking away from. Robert. I never took him. Robert was questioned on whether he knew right from wrong, and he agreed it was wrong that James Bulger was killed. He went through his activities of the day of the murder, which included going to the Strand, but he didn't mention anything more. John was interviewed as well. He felt very intimidated by the whole thing. His voice was described as little more than a nervous squeak. He was interviewed by Officer George Scott. He said that though he was friends with Robert Thompson, he distanced himself from him at school because Robert was a troublemaker. They don't sit in class together either. Robert calls other kids names. He liked skidding, which is English slang for making fun of someone. He doesn't have a lot of friends because he has a reputation for being naughty. He mostly had girls as friends. John and Robert fought a lot before they became friends. They mostly hung out when school was not in session and when John stayed at his father's house. He was usually late coming home when he spent time with Robert because Robert always persuaded him to do things like going to the railway. Robert stayed out all night sometimes, going to the entries and lighting fires to keep warm, walking along the railway. He claimed to have walked all the way to London once, but John didn't believe it. Officer Dale questioned John further. 
Dale, would you say that he was your good friend? John, no. Dale, why not? John, oh, I know, because he gets me into trouble on that. Dale, don't you think you get yourself into trouble? John, yeah. Dale, really? John, yeah. Dale, so that's not fair on Robert, is it? John, no. Dale, because you're blaming him a little bit, aren't you? John, sometimes I tell him to do things and he does. Dale, so you're as bad as him, really, aren't you, in that respect? John, no, when I say to him, sag, he doesn't. He said, because you won't, you'll get a bad education. Dale, who said that? John, me. And he says, all right then. And the teachers kidded him up. He said, she said, if you stay a whole week at school, I'll give you a prize at the end of the week. And she never. John said he was not Robert's best friend anymore, but he once was when Robert gave him things, like troll dolls. He said he didn't know at first that Robert was stealing them. He also said that Robert had an effeminate side, not only collecting dolls, but sucking his thumb. Sometimes they hung out with Robert's other friends, and sometimes they went out on their own, down the entries, walking on the walls, and climbing over into people's gardens. He knew it was wrong, but it was fun. He said the only time he stole with Robert was Friday, the day of James Bulger's disappearance. He said he never skipped school without Robert. Officer Dale questioned him further about his behavior while in Robert's company, as detailed in the following excerpt from the transcript. Dale, do you think it's exciting being with Robert, really? John, yeah, a bit. Dale, be honest. Be honest with me. John, yeah. Dale, is it? Do you do things with him you wouldn't normally do with your other friends? John, yeah. I wouldn't do anything with me other friends. Dale, why? John, because they're good. Dale, are they? John, yeah. Dale, would you do these things on your own? John, no. Dale, why? John, I'm too scared. Robert was interviewed some more. He asked about his favorite soccer team. He was asked if going to soccer games was his hobby. He said skipping school was his hobby, and he laughed. He was asked about the security footage. He denied that it was him in the footage. He also denied that he took James. He also denied that John was involved. More from the transcript. Roberts, we believe that you left with baby James and with John. Robert, who says? Roberts, we say now. Robert, no, I never left with him. Roberts, well, tell me what happened then. Robert, it shows in the paper that John had hold of his hand. Robert said he never touched him and began to cry. He claimed John grabbed the boy's hand but then let him go loose. They let him go when they were by a church. He said he told John to take him back. Robert starts to cry again because he feels he's getting all the blame for the murder. They brought up the account given by a woman who saw all three boys at the reservoir. They asked him about the injury on James's head. He said he had it when they met him. Robert said the woman might be lying. He even begins to say the officers could be lying too. He stonewalls and lies, not nearly as intimidated as John was. More from the transcript. Anne Thompson, do you want to sort all this tonight? Robert, where? Anne, do you want to sort all this out tonight? Robert, yeah. Anne, tell the truth. Robert, I am. Roberts, Robert, I know, I know when you're about to tell us the truth because you fill up with your eyes. Do you understand what I mean? And I can say that it was like before, you know, when you told us eventually about the meeting him in the Strand, right? You filled up before again. I think you were going to tell us that you were on top of that hill. Robert, we were. Robert contradicted more of the anecdotal evidence collected by the police. It was decided that he wouldn't be able to return home that night, that he would be detained. Robert asked, why do I have to stay here? John's the one that took the baby. John was still being interviewed. He said Robert was probably lying. More from that transcript. 
Dale, you see, Robert says that he was with you and that you were indeed in Boodle New Strand together. John, we wasn't. Dale, Robert says you were. John, yeah, we was, but we never saw any kids there. We never robbed any kids. Dale, so you were in Boodle New Strand? Susan, shouting, was you in Boodle Strand? John, yeah, but we never got a kid, Mom. We never, we never, we never got a kid. He's crying at this point, sobbing, getting up and out of his chair, distraught. Dale, Mrs. Venables, would you, I must ask you not to get angry with him. John, but we never got a kid, Mom. We never. We saw those two lads together. We did. We never got a kid, Mom. Mom, we never got a kid. You think we did? We never. Mom, we never. All four adults tried to calm John. His mother warned him that he'd better tell the truth. John continued to cry. More from the transcript. John, if you knew that I went to Boodle Strand, Susan, I would have strangled you, yeah. John, it wouldn't have you thought I'd killed a kid. I never because, Susan, well, I wouldn't think that. Lee, we don't think that. John, because, because if you thought I went and I sagged off and you think that I killed him, Susan, I wouldn't think you'd done that at all. John, because, because I would have told because I thought you'd think I'd done it. Susan, if I would have known all this now, John, I would have had you down the police station right away instead of them banging on my front door and making a show of me in the street. John, but I, Susan... Humiliation. John, I thought you'd think that I'd killed him. John goes into a crying jag. The officers end the interview for the time being to let John calm down. Susan says she wants it over with because she's angry. John and Robert were questioned more, and they were evasive and deceptive in many of their answers. One breakthrough occurred in an interview with Robert during his interview with Officer Jacobs. It regarded the can of paint that was found at the scene. This is a portion of that dialogue. Jacobs, we still want to know what happened with that paint, all right? Now what happened with it? Robert, he threw it in baby James's eye. That eye, I think it was, Robert indicated his left eye. Jacobs, where was that? Robert, on the railway. Robert and John deflected blame back and forth while still being interviewed in isolation. They both lied and misled the interrogators. Phil Roberts knew Robert Thompson was lying. He noticed his shuffling feet in the false crying, free of tears. Roberts was too experienced not to be able to see right through this kid. Robert was told that the DNA in the blood on his clothing and shoes matched up with blood taken from the body of James Bulger. Robert became upset and cried, though he maintained that he didn't murder him. From the transcript of that dialogue, during which Anne Thompson was present, Anne, it will be all over in a few minutes if you just tell them the truth. Robert, John threw a brick in his face. Anne, why? Robert, I don't know. Roberts, Right, try and stop, right? Let's, we've got, we've, we're getting there, aren't we? We're getting to the truth now. Robert, yeah, well, I'm going to end up getting all the blame because I've got blood on me. Robert repeated his assertion that it was John who threw the brick at James. Roberts asked Robert why he didn't try to stop John. Robert said he did, but John threw it anyway, and that when it hit James in the face, he started bleeding. James began to cry. He fell to the ground and began to bleed profusely. Detective Roberts is not entirely convinced by Robert's story. He feels that he's blaming everything on John. Robert continued to deflect and deny his involvement in James's death. He told more of his side of the story to Detective Jacobs. Robert, he threw another brick. Jacobs, and where did that hit him? Robert pointed to his body, on there. Jacobs, on the chest? Robert, on the belly. Jacobs, what kind of brick was that? Robert, a half one. Jacobs, and what happened then? 
Robert. And then he hit him again. Jacobs. What with? Robert. There was like a big metal thing that had holes in it. Jacobs. A big metal thing with holes in. Where was that? Robert. When it hit him? Jacobs. No, where was it? Where did he pick it up from? Robert. Off the... You know, where the railway tracks like that. Jacobs. Yeah, Robert in the middle of them. Where did he hit him with that? Robert in the head. Jacobs. Now, which part of the head? Robert. Up there on the top of the head. Jacobs. What did that do to him? To James. Robert. Knocked him out. Jacobs. Did it? What happened then? Robert. And then he hit him again. Jacobs. What with? Robert, a stick, and then he threw that. Jacobs, a stick, and you threw that? Robert, no, he threw it. Jacobs, where do you throw it? Robert, you know, the nettles, yeah, by where he's found. Yeah, he threw them into there. Jacobs, where, where did he hit him with the stick? Robert, in the face. Jacobs, in the face, where about in the face? Robert. I don't know where, he just went like that and hit him. Robert said James was knocked out after being struck with the stick. He didn't know if he was dead at that juncture, or so he claimed. He was asked about batteries that were found at the scene. Robert said John threw them at James's face. Robert said it was John who dropped the railway fish plate on James's head. Robert said he checked James's vital signs after this and it appeared from pressing his ear against his stomach that he was not breathing. Phil Roberts said he didn't believe that John did everything. Roberts believed that Robert hit him as well. Later, deeply distressed, Robert's mother interrogates Robert in her own right. She said to him, Bobby, why the fucking hell didn't you do something? Why didn't you go and tell someone? How could you stand there and... Robert, but I tried to get him off. He just kept hitting him and hitting him and hitting him, and I couldn't do nothing about it. Anne, well, how could you take a bloody flower over? This was a reference to when Robert took flowers to the spot where James's body was found. That section of the railroad had become an ad hoc memorial site. Robert, because then baby James knows I tried to help him up there, and I'm thinking of him now. John was with his parents at the station. It occurred to the officers that he felt inhibited during the interviews because certain things he said would upset his mother. He needed to feel more comfortable to disclose the facts of the matter without worrying that he was triggering an emotional minefield. He became upset and climbed onto his mother's lap. She cradled him like he was James's age. She and her husband assured John that whatever he disclosed, they would not get angry and tell him off. They made him feel safer. Finally, at long last, he said to her, I did kill him. This was the breakthrough the police were waiting for. John was asked why he and Robert brought James out of the strand. Robert said, let's get this kid lost. Robert wanted James to wander onto the road so he would get hit by a car. John said it was his idea to approach James, but it was Robert's idea to kill him. John claimed they looked for James's mother, but got fed up and left. When they got to a canal, Robert said, let's throw him in the water. John said, if you wanna, like, he said Robert only wanted to throw him in the shallow end. Robert tried to persuade James to jump in willingly, but James refused. This is when Robert picked James up and threw him to the ground. That's how James got the bump on his head. They ran away from James but came back. He was on his feet and walking by then. James didn't know why they went back. He said it was just because they wanted to walk around with him. John described the route they took to get to the railroad line. He broke down crying and stopped for a moment. He was asked why it was so difficult to talk about. He said, because it's the worst bit. Detective Dale said, okay, right, let, now let me tell you, I know that's the worst bit, but you know what you did, and you know if you try hard, you'll be able to tell us. What you need is to have a little rest, think about it, and just tell us what happened. John, 
We took him on the railway and started throwing bricks at him. Dale, who did? John, Robert, he just said, uh, he just said, just stand there and we'll get you a plaster or something. Dale, why did he throw bricks at him? John, I don't know. Dale, what else did he do apart from throwing bricks? John, threw the big pole at him. Detective Lee, what's that? Dale, threw a big pole at him, is that what you said? John, that knocked him out. Dale, what was the pole made of? John, steel. Dale, like a bar? John, yeah, off the track. Dale, where did the stick, where did the stones and bar hit him? John, in the head. Dale, and you say the bar knocked him out. John, yeah, onto the railway track. Dale, and then, and what happened then? John, he was just lying there. Dale, okay, keep going. Detective Scott, all those things that happened to James, they were all done by Robert. John, some from me. Scott, tell me what you did. John, just threw two bricks at him, that's all I done, because I wouldn't throw anything big at him. Scott, how big were the bricks you threw? Only teeny little stones. Scott, where did they hit him? John, on the arms. I wouldn't hit him in the head. John said Robert threw typical building bricks at James. John said he didn't want to throw anything at him. He only threw pebbles at James, and he didn't know if they did any harm. He said it was a long time after the stones and bricks were thrown at James that he was hit with a fish plate. He believed he was only struck with it once. John said he told Robert to stop it, and he urged him to leave. Detective Dale, I really shouldn't have to ask you this, but what do you think of those things? John, they're terrible. I was thinking about it all the time. John and Robert made an appearance in court that evening. Though they didn't acknowledge each other for the most part, when John was in an unmarked car, Robert walked past. They caught each other's eye for a moment, and they both smirked. The officers witnessed this and said they caught a glimpse of evil in their smiles. In Robert's eighth interview, he admitted to having made contact with James's body. He said he tried to pull him from the railway track. He lifted him by the stomach with his arms around his chest. But James was bleeding so much that Robert put him down, fearing that he too would be soaked with blood. He said he was pretty sure James was fully clothed at the time. Phil Roberts told Robert that he felt he wasn't disclosing everything that he knew. For instance, he pointed out that half of James's body was nude when he was found. Robert denied that the clothing was removed from his lower body. Robert denied removing his clothes and denied touching him. He insisted that John did all the worst of the dirty work. At one point, Robert put on an act of feeling perplexed by the very idea of killing James. However, the statement he gave to back this up was rather disconcerting. Why would I want to kill him when I've got a baby of me own, referring to his youngest sibling? If I wanted to kill a baby, I'd kill, I'd kill me own, wouldn't I? Robert was told that there were indicators that James's body was sexually violated. Robert denied having been involved with this element of the crime. When he returned to his mother, who was waiting in a detention room, he said to her, he said, I'm a pervert. They said I've played with his willy. John was interviewed again. He said Robert opened a can of paint and threw it in James's face. The paint went into James's left eye and he cried. He put his hand to his face to wipe it off. Robert asked him if his head hurt and told him he would put a plaster cast on it. Then he took a house brick and threw it in James's face. James cried and screamed and fell to the ground. He got back up after a moment. Robert told John to pick up a brick and throw it. John picked up a half brick and just threw it on the ground. He missed on purpose. Robert picked up the same brick and threw it again. John said he tried to stop him from doing it, but was unsuccessful in doing so. Robert threw this brick in James's face and it made James's nose bleed. James kept getting up, but Robert said to him, stay down you stupid divvy. John didn't know why Robert wanted James to stay down. 
Robert took James to an area where there were more bricks and threw more of them at him. John missed on purpose, and Robert criticized what he perceived as a bad aim. John picked up the fish plate but dropped it because it was so heavy. Robert dropped it on the side of James's head, and John believed that was what knocked James out. They threw a few more bricks at James. John said James was making what he called spluttering sounds as he lay on the rail on his stomach. He said Robert was laughing about it. John said it was Robert who pulled James' pants and underwear off. John removed his shoes. Robert threw the underwear in back of him. He picked them up again and put them on James's face, where they absorbed a significant amount of blood. John broke down crying at this juncture of the interview. In Robert's ninth interview, he denied what John said about what he had done. In John's eighth interview, he said he and Robert covered James's face with bricks. It was Robert's idea. He was asked what was done to James after his pants and underwear were removed. John admitted that he kicked James in the chest and in his groin. He also punched him in the face a few times. He and Robert kicked James while he was lying down. He also stamped him in the legs. John got blood on his shoes from kicking James in the face. Robert kicked James in the face several times as well. John claimed he only kicked him in the face once or twice. Though Robert had been largely deceptive and evasive during his interviews, the information gathered from the interview of John Venables provided the police with enough evidence to press charges, along with the DNA results. On the evening of February 20th, 1993, Robert Thompson and John Venables were charged with the abduction and murder of James Bulger. The two boys were found guilty as charged on November 24th, 1993. They were the youngest persons to be charged with murder in modern British history. They were sentenced to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure until a parole hearing was to decide in June 2001 if they were fit for release. The board recommended that upon their release, they should be on what is referred to as a lifelong license, meaning certain conditions had to be met by the offenders in order to remain free. Parole, in other words, probation. In 2010, John Venables breached the terms of his license and was sent back to prison. He was released again in 2013. In November 2017, he was sent back to prison when child pornography was found on his computer. Both boys have claimed to suffer the effects of post-traumatic stress disorder in the years following the murder. When they were released, they re-entered society with new identities because of death threats from vigilantes. The parents of both boys had to relocate and conceal their identities because of threats from the same vigilantes. Though John Venables portrayed himself as a reluctant participant in the crime, he had a well-documented history of violent and destructive behavior. He physically attacked both of his parents on occasion and did the same at school. He also destroyed and threw around objects at school. One of his teachers struggled to deal with John. John had a history of bullying other children. On one occasion, he held a 12-inch ruler to another boy until the boy became red in the face. The teacher discerned that John was trying to choke him. She struggled to pry John off the boy. Robert Thompson was sly, manipulative, and abusive in school. He was remembered for verbally and physically abusing other students, up to and including throwing gravel in their faces. Robert would cry and play the victim when he was confronted by school authorities about his conduct. If you wish to investigate this case further, an excellent documentary was made called Unforgiven, The Boys Who Killed a Child. It is available for viewing on YouTube. It contains excerpts from the actual audio recordings of the interview sessions. Thank you for listening to Human Monsters. Bye for now.